Hi, good afternoon. Thank you again for the invitation to speak at this conference. Um, I'm here to talk about the development and assessment of orphan drugs at the FDA. Um, and, well, the FDA is a, we're a popular group to talk about. And I think everybody loves to talk about us, and um, a lot of people have a lot to say. Um, not all of it good, but I'm, I'm hoping that I can illustrate some of the work that we do and some of the involvement that we, um, that we have with assessing drugs for rare diseases and, and what role we play in the development of drugs. Um, the FDA is often asked, why aren't we doing more to um, get more drugs approved? Um, well, the answer is that that is not really the FDA miss mission, is to go out and develop new drugs. The FDA's mission is to review and evaluate and approve drugs based on the data that was submitted to us from industry sponsors, pharmaceutical companies. Um, and, oops. So today, what I'd like to talk about is give you an overview of what FDA does in terms of marketing approval and talk a little bit more specifically about our office, the Office of Orphan Products Development, and then also give you some insight that, um, about what kinds of involvement our office and FDA has with patient groups in terms of getting drugs out there. Um, before I go into this slide, what I need for you to do is just sort of take, draw yourself a mental picture and imagine a time before the FDA and before there was drug, drug regulation and sort of maybe even imagine yourself in this world of um, herbal medicines and, and nutraceuticals where there's a lot of product out there, but no one really knows what it does. There's no guarantee to the safety, no one really, there's no consistency from product to product. There's really no good information whether, the, whether these products are out there. Well, in comes the FDA, and we are, we are there to review safety and efficacy of drugs. And why, why look at these? What, what does safety and efficacy mean? Well, we look at safety because we want to limit the risk that patients are exposed to when they're taking a new drug. There's an old saying in pharmacology that the poison is in the dose. There's always a risk with a drug. It could be a very safe drug taken at a very high level. For example, you can, you can overdose on um, iron, uh, iron capsules, um, or you can overdose on aspirin. So certainly the poison is in the dose. So we always want to take a look at what dose is important, and what dose is safe, and what dose is going to be effective. Um, and certainly efficacy is the second, second thing that we look at. And really, I do mean second, because safety really is the number one priority. With the efficacy, Certainly efficacy demonstration is important because we don't want to be in the situation where we have a drug that's out on the market that doesn't work. And in that case, you're wasting your money, you're wasting time seeking treatment with a drug that doesn't work. Um, it, it's something that we want to avoid. And in addition, it also exposes patients to a risk with no benefit. Exa again, poison is in the dose. So why expose patients to something that can put could potentially lead to harm, which has no demonstrated benefit. Um, certainly, it's difficult to unapprove a drug that's out there that's been approved on the basis of efficacy. In times where we have unapproved drugs, taken them off the market, it's nearly always because of a safety risk. And uh, also, um, we are, are in search of demonstrating efficacy because it having a drug that is not efficacious shifts a research focus from those that could be developed that actually would be efficacious. So, what are the phases of drug development? This is sort of a drug development 101. And I've color coded this slide. And the color coding is that the red is sort of the not in people at all, kind of a red light stop. The yellow is sort of under investigation, and as my three-year-old says, green means go. <laughs> so, um, so let me start with a preclinical. What, what is involved with, or, with a non-clinical phase of drug development? Uh, generally, this is a proof of concept animal and slash animal studies. Animal studies, of course, are important because you, these are the studies we, where we are establishing the actual pharmacology of the molecule. How is it, abs it, how is it absorbed 
whether you take that drug orally or if you take it intravenously, how is it getting to the target organ that you need it to go to? How is that drug eliminated from the system? How is it distributed throughout the system? <clears throat> um, also, this is where we establish um, reproductive toxicity, uh, carcinogenicity. So a lot of big questions are answered at the non-clinical stage. This is where the decision is made. Do we put this drug into humans or not? And of course, with these animal studies, their doses are much, much higher, multiples of what the human, potential human dose would be. And then based on positive clinical studies, um, it'll transition into humans. And again, with the, the human studies, they're, they're in yellow, highlighted with that sort of, sort of a go, but with caution. Um, at this point, you're in study. Your drug is in an experimental stage. And in fact, the, the, the FDA term for a drug in its experimental stage is a drug that is under IND, which is under an investigational new drug application. So phases one, two, and three, drug is under IND, it's in the experimental stage. The first stage is in which we're de determining drug metabolism, um, dosing range studies, how much can a, is, is tolerable in he healthy human volunteers most often. And the second phase is blinded open label studies in a target population. This is sort of like a pre pre-study to determine, well, what kinds of things are we going to look at in that third study? Um, much like Dr. Jason had talked about trying to identify what are those questions? Do we answer it in a, a yes-no capacity or do we answer sort of a, a graded, like how do we know just what questions to ask? That, so that's what a phase two study is for, is try sort of an experiment of your experiment. Uh, finally, phase three is often also called a pivotal study, and this is your big, ran typically a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. And this is where you're actually looking in your disease target population and you're evaluating sef safety and the efficacy. And then finally, FDA, it, all this information is submitted to FDA, and I do mean all this information, it's a, a truckload of information, volumes and volumes and volumes of information is sent to FDA for review and ultimately, one hopes, approval. And in some cases, when there's lingering questions at the approval stage, um, there can be arrangements for what's called a phase four, which is a phase four study, which is a post-marketing study in um, a larger population. It's usually to, um, to do follow-up studies or to establish a link between what, how the drug was approved and some um, additional benefits. Mm. This should be really easy, right? <laughs> um, actually, all I'd like for you to do is just focus at the, um, those top three arrows, the phase one, phase two, phase three. And that's the, kind of the whole point of the slide, is just to give you an idea of how, how this timeline can overlap. Before the phase one study, um, you're in that animal testing stage, you have synthesis, you have purification, you're making your drug, you're te testing it in animals. That big blue line is when you, su you submit your, I your IND application to FDA, which again, your IND is kind of a license by the FDA to allow the use of a drug experimentally. So your phase one studies is looking at it in, in healthy human volunteers. If the drug has already been out on the market and phase studies have been done for another drug, you, there's no, really no need to repeat those. But the phase two and three studies, again, they'll often overlap, and the phase three study will ultimately um, culminate in submission of data for the, IN, for, the, um, for the NDA. Which the NDA, which I know I'm throwing around a lot of acronyms already, the NDA, um, is a application for marketing, and it stands for a um, new drug application NDA. And that's what you think of as, that's the marketing approval. Okay, clinical trials, as I had mentioned earlier, are designed with the idea to establish a safety and efficacy. Safety is how much drug are you going to take, why, um, and for how long. And efficacy is, is um, just, we evaluate for efficacy just to make sure that, you know, effects are not happening on, just by random chance. We want to eliminate bias in the information that we have. Certainly, you know the placebo effect. Um, so, 
um, just we want to eliminate the op the um, the chance that there is some sort of observed um, an effect that is observed but maybe not real. Uh, also, we want in a, when we're evaluating effic efficacy, we want to be sure that the effect have, has clinical significance or clinical relevance. So, for example, if you're evaluating someone for their ability to walk further, how much further? that they're walking makes a difference. So if someone can't walk at all and suddenly can, after their drug treatment, can get up and walk 10 feet, certainly is more significant than someone who can walk 1,000 yards and can walk 10 more feet afterwards. So it all is kind of, um, you have to look at things in context. And certainly um, one of the, the most important things that we're looking for when we're establishing efficacy is for the reduction of the influence of any confounding variables. So for example, if you start a drug regimen and also change your diet, or if you're starting, um, or suddenly, it could be anything, it could change, you could change your work habit, you could, um, you know, there are so many variables, it's, it's really difficult to tease them out. And so that is why FDA, goes with this standard of uh, the gold standard of a clinical, of the clinical trial, which is a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study. <clears throat> um, usually these are in large numbers of patients. However, um, with a small population, it's going to be difficult. With a smaller disease population that affects, I don't know, say 100,000 people, you're not going to be able to enroll 20,000 patients in a clinical trial like uh, you could if you were doing a drug for an antihypertensive. So with this in mind, uh, smaller, small diseases that affect a smaller number of patients uh, are often um, uh, let me start over again. When we are value, or running a trial, or when sponsors are running a trial in a smaller disease population, they're often forced, or you know, basically it's impossible to do a larger trial, and so they have to come up with some alternative designs for their trials. And some of these include open label designs, historical control designs, crossovers with drugs. And I realize I'm not not all of you are up with the jargon of clinical trial design, but the point is that, that I want you to take home is while there are, there's a, the gold standard being the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, this is held up as a gold standard of how FDA likes to have things done. However, the FDA realizes that it's not always possible to do that, and FDA is willing to look at alternative trial designs. However, both just about anybody who is doing this kind of research also realizes that each one of these trial designs are fraught with many more challenges than it is being able to do a straightforward design. So for example, um, a, a historical controlled trial would be a trial that you have um, a group of patients here and you treat them and you, and you, you essentially see what kind of changes you're observing from the, their treatment and then the idea with the historical controls that you can look back in time and either see how these patients or another group of patients fared without treatment. Well, that's always, that can be quite difficult because sometimes you have information on the patients now that's important that you didn't have on the patients before, 10 years ago or 100 years ago or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's very hard to capture sort of the natural history of the disease and then translate that over to what's happening after you give the drug. Um, so, in essence, smaller patient populations do require um, an alternate trial design. FDA is open to this, but it takes more time. It takes more, er, it takes more time in the designing plan, more thoughtfulness in the design stage. And um, orphan products, I think a lot of people um, have the understanding that, well, if it's an orphan, then the FDA won't hold it to the same rigor in their review as with a drug for any other disease. Well, um, it turns out that the FDA feels that patients with a rare disease are just as entitled to have a safe and effective drug as patients without a rare disease. So we are, we do hold, we do hold sponsors up to the same review standards as for non-orphan diseases. So I wanted to give you an idea, a little bit about structure. Uh, Dr. Kiley had presented 
earlier on an overall organizational chart of what HHS or Department of Health and Human Services looks like. And in that chart, he had provided where NIH sits and the FDA sits. And I wanted to give you a picture of how FDA is structured internally. And from there, I can talk about what our office does and how we interact with, other, with the parts of FDA. So when, a, when drug information, when these INDs, the NDAs, you know, the IND again being the, ex, ex, the, ex, the license for an experimental use, and when all of the data is accumulated for review and sent to FDA, and is submitted to an to the for the I'm sorry for a new drug application, these are all reviewed by what we call product review centers. There are six of these. Um, CDER is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. So that's a, we just sort of say CDER is drugs uh, or drug review. Um, CBER is Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Uh, there's CDRH, uh, CIFSAN, CVM, and NCTR. Really the two big ones that we're talking about today would be, well, the big one would be C CDER, which is the drug review center. But I just wanted to give you an idea that there are actually six review centers that are reviewing, and it, they're all based on the kind of product that they are reviewing. So this is where the reviewers sit. This is where the, the evaluation for approval, this is where they are. Okay, down underneath that, the line, there, I drew a separator, and there's, a, uh, there's the Office of the Commissioner, and there's also the Office of Regulatory Affairs. Now, I drew these separately to give you the idea that they are separate. They are not part of any one center. In fact, um, they, these two offices work um, on so many issues that go across centers that um, there's really no need to put them within one center. So within the Office of, the office of Warfarin Products, which is my office, is in the office of the commissioner. The Office of Regulatory Affairs, by the way, is your, your groups of inspectors, your everything from um, canned foods to drugs to medical devices. They go out and do the inspect inspections of, um, of sponsors, industry sponsors, that is, for compliance in terms of um, production um, and quality control. So again, Office of Orphan Products is within the Office of the Commissioner. And the reason that we're in the Office of the Commissioner is so that we can interact with Center for Drugs, Center for Biologics, and to a degree we do interact with the Center for um, Devices and for Foods. So what is an orphan product? Um, I just want to kind of take a, a mental, like draw a mental break here. Previously I had been talking about marketing approval. What kinds of information is needed for marketing approval to get a new drug to the market and available for purchase by patients? Okay, now I'm talking about something a little bit different. These are orphan products and this is not an, a marketing approval process. It's a process for designation which allows benefits. And I'll explain more, I hope, as I go. So, what is an orphan product? Um, orphan products are products that are to treat rare diseases, and they're orphaned by the pharmaceutical industry. And they are orphaned because there is generally a very poor return on their financial investment. Um, by definition, orphan products are drugs and biologics. Um, we don't have um, devices or medical foods included as orphan products. And uh, the, the definition for what is a rare disease or a condition is any disease or condition that affects less than 200,000 people in the United States. And that's a prevalence number, it's not an incidence number, by the way. Um, if, uh, rarely, if there is a d disease that affects over 200,000 in the U.S., the, uh, the law also allows that if the cost of development for the drug is much greater than the potential return, then that would also be considered a poor return on investment and therefore also be considered an orphan drug. So really there's two ways to be designated as an orphan drug. One is that you affect a small number of patients or you can demonstrate, in, the, in case you're over the 200, that you are not going to make a return on your investment. 99.999% of our designations have been for small, the small diseases or rare diseases. 
So I mentioned a little bit about the law. Um, in 1983, the Orphan Drug Act was passed, and actually this, the Orphan Drug Act was passed as a result of lobbying through patient groups. Uh, the Orphan Drug Act creates incentives for orphan product development. It's an incentive program. It makes that, it, it makes a return on investment available when there wasn't any. And how does this, how do we do it? Well, the, the primary thing that the, that the Orphan Drug Act offers is seven years of marketing exclusivity from the date of marketing approval for a drug. So what that means is that the FDA will not approve the same drug for the same indication for seven years after that drug is approved. However, if there's a better drug that comes along, it's clinically superior, and they've demonstrated their clinical superiority in clinical studies, we will say, okay, you can break this exclusivity. You're allowed on the market too, because we want to keep First of all, we want to get drugs to the market, and secondly, we certainly don't want to um, inhibit a better drug from coming along to the market. We want patients to benefit. Um, another way to break this exclusivity is if you were to demonstrate you had a different drug. So if, um, suppose you had a, a, a drug to treat, um, well, let's just pick um, infliximab. Okay, suppose infliximab which holds orphan designation, suppose that were to get approved, um, another drug that is just like infliximab would be excluded from entering the marketplace. However, if there are another drug, and we've talked a lot about Benicar, if that were to be approved, since it's a very different drug than infliximab, we would allow that to enter the market because it's a different drug. So the whole idea is seven years of marketing exclusivity from the date of approval. Um, it's a monopoly. And it allows uh, the innovator to recoup their costs, and they, and they do. Um, and some of them do quite well. Um, skipping down a notch, we also allow tax credits for research costs. These are credits for research. It's not a tax deduction. So that means the money that, you've, that was spent on research can be, deduct, can be taken off or, or um, used as dollars on an income statement, or on a tax statement, rather. We also have a grants program from, for clinical research, and, and compared to NIH's program, it's, it's very tiny, but I will explain more about our grants program on the next slide. And we also provide guidance from the Office of Orphan Products through the FDA, and we, are, we offer this guidance to investigators, to industry sponsors, we offer to anyone who holds orphan drug designation. Um, this is invaluable because so many times, especially a, an independent investigator or a sponsor who's working, who's just a very small company, they're not Merck, they're not Pfizer, they don't have a huge regulatory staff of hundreds. It might be one person who's not only their regulatory person, but he's marketing and, and business development too. So um, this guidance that we provide th through <coughs> Orphan Products gives, them, gives, gives outsider, outsiders a chance to take a look at the inside and understand how FDA thinks. They can do anything from ro run a protocol idea past us to see what we think or, gee, you know, we, we've had a bad interaction with a review, di review division in one of those product review centers before and we're afraid to come back and, and we're, we are there to um, um, serve as a, a source of advice and advocacy. Um, and the one thing that I skipped was that marketing application for filing fee waivers. Um, now this actually is not technically part of the Orphan Drug Act, but it is considered one of the benefits of orphan drug designation. So mentally, you know, if you really want to split hairs, you'd say, well, that's not, shouldn't be on the slide, but really it's, it's part of the package. And I'm sure you've heard a bit or two um, in the news about how the FDA receives money from the pharmaceutical industry for reviewing drugs. Well, that's, that is true. Um, the FDA has what's called, um, a pres um, well, the actual law is called the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. But um, what this is, it's a, a significant chunk of money um, 
that is paid to the FDA upon submission of the NDA or their marketing approval application. And the sum is about, I think this year it's like, what, six, $600,000. So it's over half a million dollars. So for a small company, that's significant. If you're a big company, you're making a drug that's gonna make you a billion dollars, a half a million dollars for a, a, a user fee, for the application fee, isn't gonna be that bad. But if you're, if you're talking about a drug that is made by a small company, and they need every little bit of cash that they possibly could, could have. So the FDA will waive this marketing fee waiver. Or I'm sorry, they would waive this marketing fee. Um, now, I'd also mention that we have a grants program. And actually, our, our grants program is um, much smaller than NIH's budget. Uh, we are $14 million, that's million with an M and not with a B, as we'd <laughs> much rather be. Um, uh, $14 million is really not a lot of money at all. In fact, if you were to take our entire budget and um, parse out to each person in the country who actually has a rare disease, that would end up being a whopping 50 cents per person. So, and that money is, is um, well used, however, even though it's not much per person, we do um, manage to do quite a bit with it. In fact, we, uh, we fund about 20 or 30 new grants a year. And again, these are only clinical studies that we're funding. We don't fund preclinical research, so that animal research, we don't fund that. But anything that's with it, that has an IND, essentially, is eligible for one of our grants. And our grants, again, are not insignificant. Um, for a phase one study, again, that's sort of your human dosing study, um, the um, investigators are, are eligible for up to $150,000 a year for up to a three-year grant. And for those doing a phase two or three study, that number is um, up to $350,000 for a phase two or phase three study, and that's over three years. So that's it for most of our, since most of our, um, our grants are three-year studies and they're phase two and three studies, each time we approve a grant, we're essentially committing a million dollars to an investigator to do a study. And, and, and in fact, it's, it's amazing what has, has resulted from our funding investment. In fact, there have been over, I think, 38 new drugs that have come to the market as a result of FDA orphan grant funding. So it's always nice to see when there's actual a, a, a product from our investment. And often this money is used as seed money. It's not necessarily money that's doing like the clinical trial and you know it's certainly not enough money to get everything through the FDA but it certainly is enough money to get the drug and the indication on the radar screens of um, developers and, and industry. Um, so within the Office of Orphan Products we actually we are from the government and we really are here to help um, or at least we we hope to be. Um, Again, in review, we are organizationally independent from the re product review division so that we can slip in there and work with just about any one of them. Um, our function is to administer the Orphan Drug Act. Our purpose, unlike marketing application reviews, is we review applications for orphan drug designation and offer the assistance when, when those are um, approved. And then also we administer our grants program. It's, I meant to change that to 14 million in 2005. And again, I wanted to clarify, and it's, 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 it's such an important clarification to make. I just want to make sure we're clear on it. With orphan designation, an application, this, I just wanted to tell you what a designation is and how it's done. When an orphan application is submitted to the FDA, it goes to the Office of Orphan Products Development. It's a very small application. It might be maybe a 20-page synopsis of, um, of what the rare, a description of what the rare disease is and the scientific rationale for the drug and also a discussion about the size of the population. So we'll review this and this application can come in any time during that IND process. 
And once a sponsor is, receives designation approval, uh, a sponsor is eligible for these economic in incentives. And the sponsor is also eligible for getting advice and help from the Office of Orphan Product as they, de as they develop their drug and as they go and on with their discussions with their product review division. What it doesn't mean is that it's not marketing approval. And a lot of people kind of miss this. Um, marketing approval, very different. Again, sponsors have, for marketing approval, sponsors must do their clinical trials under an IND and use that data to support their marketing application. Um, the data that's submitted for the product review di division spans everything from the animal data all the way through human um, safety, efficacy, stability, quality, all of it. So that's all reviewed by those product review divisions. Um, and once they get marketing approval, the FDA will author, what it means is FDA will authorize the sale of the drug in the US. So I wanted to give you two examples um, of two drugs that are in the pipeline for sarcoidosis, uh, infliximab and gal galumibab. <laughs> um, <laughs> I could have picked a better name. Um, <laughs> Uh, orphan, so these two drugs both have been granted or, orphan designations. So they've come to our office, they've at, they get our help, we've granted them designation. If either one of these were to get approved, um, they would be entitled to the marketing exclusivity and the user or the application fee um, waiver. All of those good things that I mentioned as benefits from the Orphan Drug Act. But these drugs have not yet been approved for marketing. So just to give you that distinction. And um, when it comes to insurance, um, really the big daddy is when something is approved for marketing. You know, you just can't argue with that. Um, sometimes orphan designation will um, bring a, um, a, a sense of validity or recognition by FDA. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it sort of means FDA has not um, said absolutely not. It's the FDA has said possibly there's potential here. So uh, this picture, <laughs> the gray days before the Orphan Drug Act. Actually, they were quite gray. Before the Orphan Drug Act was passed in 1983, there were fewer than 15 drugs that had been approved for rare diseases. And it was much like the nutraceutical, um, botanical situation now, where there are limited options and what options were out there, there was very limited data for. Things were being used off-label. No one really knew what the safety and efficacy were or was for these, for these options. Well, the Orphan Drug pa Act passed over 20 years ago. Um, now there are over 1,600 drugs that hold orphan designation. And uh, it's kind of, a, I did this slide a few months ago. There were 256 drugs at the time that I made this slide. Um, more, I'm sure there are several more now. But there are 256 drugs, at least, that have been approved for the treatment of rare diseases. And um, nearly 50%, this is kind of a neat figure, that about 50% of biological products that have been approved since 1982 are orphan products. So certainly, um, um, some, some of the bio, well, the biotech industry has certainly benefited, um, namely Amgen and Genentech. Uh, some of their, their first drugs to be approved for marketing were also orphan drugs. And certainly patient groups have had a huge impact on facilitating research and, and drug development. And here's a few of them, Nord, and Genetic Alliance, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, et cetera. And I wanted to just finally, um, the last topic is to just focus on patient groups partnering with the FDA and what kinds of um, ways patient groups have, we have observed patient groups being involved in drug development. Certainly um, for drug development, patients need the drug. Um, they either get it, get a drug that is approved for a different use and get it off label and in other cases, the drug isn't approved yet, and you just need drugs, drug for trials, just to do a trial. Um, also, um, patient groups who, have the des who are wanting to get marketing approval and or reimbursement from insurance, 
need to have some data to present either to the FDA or to the payer. And finally, if this data is to be generated, um, you need what's what we affectionately know, know as an ONTG, which is a one neck to grab, um, also known as an IND holder, um, for clinical studies. And so essentially what that is is that you need someone to take um, responsibility and to, um, to um, um, take up the, uh, take up the um, relationship for the, um, for between the investigator and, and it could be the investigator and the FDA, but someone who is um, handling the regulatory responsibility. Um, so again, the, the IND holder is the, the party that would be running the trials in support of an NDA. Um, they're also responsible for ensuring the, sh the safety of patients in trials. And again, they're responsible for the regulatory paperwork. So um, in terms of partnering uh, with a potential IND holder, as patient groups have been um, very proactive in terms of partnering with, I, with, who, with others, with researchers, in terms of um, guaranteeing or securing an IND. And certainly the easiest way to go is if you're dealing with a, um, a company that has a drug for an approved use, the easiest way to go certainly would be to go through that NDA holder and obtain the approved drug for your, your trial. Um, well, if that route doesn't work, there's another way. Um, sometimes you can get someone else, another, maybe another small company, who would be interested in potentially licensing a drug from a manufacturer. And you can use them as a licensing partner. And sometimes I think, oh, you know, I can't, I can't do the math. You know, it just seems like um, a lot of these sort of licensing partners can, can wiggle out some kind of licensing agreement where there is a financial benefit for them, where it may not be apparent to me. I, I'm just a scientist, I'm not a business person. So, you know, they, these industry, this sort of that second tier, you know, the licensing partners can sometimes really work out some amazing agreements. Um, and then finally, uh, another nice partner would be a, a purely academic investigator. Um, and this person who would be running a clinical trial and who has the, the IND for this study. Um, in terms of actually running the, the study, getting the safety and the efficacy data, it, it does cost money. And it, it certainly does cost quite a bit of money. And the FDA has, a, the, our orphan products program is there to provide funding for these studies, as well as NIH. Um, and there are also, there are foundations and sometimes, again, um, going through, going, going through various, exploring various partnerships can lead you to a source of funding. Uh, well, one, one stumbling block when you have your industry um, with their drug that's out there and um, this, this industry has their, their drug approved right now um, and suppose you wanted to run your, your trial using their safety information to support your IND, your license to use that drug experimentally. Well, you need to ask the industry sponsor if they'd be willing to share that information. So essentially you're going to that sponsor who has the approved drug and you say, can we use your animal studies and can we use your, some of your human dosing studies? To, so, um, and we promise we won't look at them, but we're just asking you to let the FDA look at that in the context of this trial. And many times, many, many, many times, um, the sponsor will say yes. Um, they say yes if they think there is a potential financial benefit or a patient benefit. Um, they may say no. Um, they may say no because they are aware of a safety issue or they, um, or they could say no because they, I don't know, just lots of, lots of reasons. Anything from safety to potentially limited drug supply 
to not wanting to have to deal with any regulatory issues that could come up later, um, or they just are not financially interested in it, and you know that's just the way that's their business decision is that they just may say there's I, we don't see any reason to do this and so um, not being from the industry side, I don't always know all these answers it happens and it's not always for a bad reason you know sometimes they have a very valid reason for not wanting to share data um, frequently um, again it's frequently done with academic investigators and certainly if you're using a dose that is an already approved dose there's almost well, if you're using, it's very um, likely or very easy. Um, it really facilitates things if you're using the same dose that is a, as the approved dose. Um, and certainly, if all else fails, you can always wait until the pup, when that drug runs off patent and it becomes a generic drug. And that, then that information is shared. But I also wanted to mention patient groups and some of the some of the other patient groups that are out there and some of the things that they've done in terms of drug development and um, assessments and patient identification. And certainly NORD, which is the National Organization of Rare Diseases, which I'm sure you know of, is really the mother of all patient groups. And Abby Myers, who is the president of NORD, was very involved with getting the Orphan Drug Act passed. Um, some of the other ones that you may not have heard of, um, but are, are doing a lot of work, um, PXE International has developed a huge database for um, testing and identifying genetics, uh, genetic markers of the disease um, Pseudoxanthoma elasticum. An Alpha One Foundation, if you were to ever look at sort of a model patient group in terms of getting sponsor involvement and in terms of getting awareness out there, um, the Alpha One Foundation would certainly be something to look at. Um, they have worked very closely with pharma and um, again, just it's kind of a model group. Um, the Muscular Dystrophy Parents Project is a group that, um, of course, it's parents of muscular dystrophy patients, and they are a patient group that has, I really, they, don't, they really don't have to work hard in terms of patient awareness, but they have partnered, well, unofficially partnered with PTC Therapeutics, who is in development of a drug for the treatment of muscular dystrophy. Uh, Cystinosis Foundation, um, this is a special, this is maybe perhaps another model um, to look at is uh, how uh, this drug company called Sigma Tau had picked up the development of a drug that essentially no one else wanted. Uh, it was really an orphan of orphans, especially since cystinosis affects about 300 people in the U.S. Um, and they, the Sigma Tau and some of the investigators at NIH really have been working relentlessly toward the approval of um, cysteamine for the treatment of cystinosis of the eye drops. And finally, a patient who just, I mean, I could go on and on, but um, the Pompeii Disease Organization works very closely with enzymes, with enzymes. So the idea is that there are patient groups that work very, very closely with either drug development, people, I mean, drug developers, i.e., the industry, um, or they work in terms of um, just as a foundation to get awareness out there, or have even become intimately involved, as PXE has, with uh, the research. So um, that wraps up my talk. Um, I do want to leave you at least with contact information. And this is the FDA home office number in Rockville, Maryland, and um, our, our website address. And um, I want to thank you again for the time and for um, patience as we head toward a break.